Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. If you're interested in multifamily real estate, but don't know how or where to begin, our guide on how to start investing in multifamily real estate breaks down everything you need to know about identifying good investments plus real world examples. Download your copy in the show notes or visit lifebridgecapital.com forward slash start now to start your journey in multifamily real estate. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. It's that time of week again where my business partner, Sam Russ, takes over the show and interviews our guests. I hope you enjoy the show. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Sam Rust, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome to the show Joseph Vyrie. Uh, Joseph is the principal at U.S. Tax Advisors Group. Uh, as a cost segregation professional, he's helped property owners defer or eliminate millions of dollars in income taxes by leveraging IRS compliant cost segregation studies. Uh, Joseph, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. No, thanks for having me on, Sam. Excellent. Well, I was looking at your career. I uh, definitely have spent quite a bit of time in the tax space. Excited to have you on to talk about cost segregation and some of how that applies not just to large multifamily, but to some smaller stuff as well, but maybe for people who haven't heard of cost segregation study, if you could explain at a 30,000 foot level what we're doing, uh, because it, it sounds a little bit like a scam. I know the first time I heard about it, I was a little suspect. I was like, wait, I can defer or eliminate that much in taxes? This can't be legit. How is it legit? Well, okay. So uh, I laughed so hard because when I first started, which was... Um, in 2007 or eight, I can't remember, but a uh, long time ago, that was the big uh, buzz was, was you get to a property owner or the accountant, they go, this is a scam. It's got to be a scam. Uh, and it's not a scam. Uh, and, and basically, um, this accelerated depreciation has been around. I've heard some say, oh, since the 30s, but I have 1930s, but I have no idea if that's true or not. All I can tell you is in modern day, there was, a, um, there was a court case in 1997, and the judge um, uh, voted on, uh, ruled on the side of the, um, the company Hospital Corporation of America, which was suing the IRS. And he was so upset with the IRS's attitude towards accelerated depreciation, even though they said, yeah, this is the right way you should, you know. He said, look, IRS, I want you to publish a document. So it took a couple of years, and in 2004, the IRS publish the audit technique guidelines and it's on it's it's on the um, internet so just type in irs audit technique guidelines for cost segregation and you'll see why it's legitimate there's no question it is the way you depreciate a building and what we're doing is is is, is it's complex but it's simple so i'll give you the simple high level version all we're doing is we are breaking out the personal property of the building and the land improvements of the building because they have shorter lives. And I can give you one example. If I point to somebody who owns a multifamily or a single family and point down the carpet to the carpet and say, well, this lasts 27 and a half years, which is straight line for residential, they would say, you crazy. I'd be lucky if I get five years. Well, the IRS recognized that all across the building. So about 25% of the building can be put in shorter lives. And because it's put in shorter lives, it is um, because it can be put in shorter lives, it can be then uh, combined with um, the 27 and a half year and it gives the client the um, acceleration of their depreciation. So instead of waiting 27 and a half years, what the client, the owner of the building gets is they get all of the depreciation the year they bought the building. So if they bought it in 2020 for the 2020 tax return, I would give them that 25% as their, their deduction, additional depreciation, rather than if they just did straight line. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So at a, at a high level, we're just pushing forward depreciation, pulling it from the entire life and compressing it into some smaller windows uh, based on IRS approved guidelines. Yes. And um, there is a concept called uh, bonus, 100% bonus depreciation, which was the new tax law a couple of years ago, the Trump tax law. 
And basically the reason why they get it all at once is because they get 100% of every life of an asset that's 20 years or less. Well, I just mentioned five year, which is the inside of the building, 15 year, which is the outside of the building. So obviously, um, obviously the, um, sorry, let me, obviously they, um, uh, uh, that's under 20 years. So, you, so we, so what I find that 25%, they get all in tax year 2020. If you buy one in 2021, 20, if you bought one this year, you'll get it for 21 tax return. Is the federal government looking at doing away with that as part of Biden's new tax plan that he's floating around? I mean, it's very early in the process, so who's to say? But is that even on the table at this point to do away with bonus depreciation? Okay, a couple things. Number one is I am not an accountant, although I I walk in that world, so I can't give tax advice, and I'm not a politician. (laughs) However, (laughs) I will just give you my opinion, and my opinion is this. I don't see how they could pull that off no matter what capital gains rates, could they increase them? Yeah, they probably will. But as far as getting rid of, of, of the bonus depreciation um, ends in two tax year 2022 anyway, but you can still get your, your value of cost segregation, but instead of getting it all in, in that year that you buy it, it just means there's going to be trails for five years. So you're still going to get the most, you're still going to get the big bang for the buck. It's like the old going back to the old days. Um, But as far as any changes to depreciation with the Biden, um, man, depreciation is so important to building owners. I don't think there's any way they're going to touch that at all. Yeah. So substantively, the depreciation, it's not going away. And I would agree with you there. It's just too big of a deal um, for too many voters. Uh, But the bonus depreciation itself, that ability to accelerate it all into one year, that expires next year. So next year is the last year you can take it. Tax year 2022. So you're right, next year. And then it it gradually goes. So the the 23, it's 75%, 74, 50%, 75. Is that right? Two, two, three, four, five. Yeah, 75, it's um, uh, 25% bonus. Okay. So, you know, it it gradually phases out, but who knows what Congress is going to do. They may decide to continue the 100% bonus. Depends on how the economy is doing. Yeah, yeah. And by the time that it comes up for a decision or there's an ability to make a different decision, we're probably going to have a different Congress. So who's to say? (laughs) Who's to say, yeah. Never prognosticate the weather or politicians. But here's one point. I would take the depreciation if it's out there. I think you should always take it because you'll never get hurt by doing accelerated depreciation. Even if you get it on the back end, you're going to get it. It's just a a matter of when. Are you going to get it in tax year 2021 or are you going to have to wait to when you sell the property five years down the road? It doesn't make any difference. You'll still get the benefit. So if you're on the fence and cash flow is not a problem, I would say just do it. The depreciation then will be in the bank and you use it when you use it because depreciation losses are good for 15 years. And you just use it up as you go each year. If you use it all in one year, it's gone. But if you, if it takes you five years, little by little, that's, you can take all of it over five years. Yeah. So the federal government obviously is giving us this leeway to take the depreciation a couple of different ways. Your firm, uh, U.S. Tax Advisors Group, assists people in completing these cost segregation studies, but you don't get to ride for free all the way through. Usually our projects, you know, it's a five-year hold, three to seven years if we're going to uh, extend the windows a little bit. Um, and there's such a thing as depreciation recapture. Ah, could you walk us through what that process looks like, um, especially for owners of these larger multifamily properties, you know, maybe 15, 20, 40 million, you know, they've realized a substantial amount of gain by realizing those depreciation at the front end but then they're getting ready to sell. What's that process like on the back end? Okay, it, it's complex. It's complicated. But here is Joe's opinion because I talk to a lot of audiences that have a lot of CFOs. And now I'm talking about the big buildings. Now I'm not talking about small single family homes. I'm talking about $500 million buildings. And basically the consensus, because I try and, and nail this down with every CFO. And what I've come up with was, is a two years hold. So in other words, if you're going to hold the property for two years, I think you should move forward and do cost segregation. If you're a flipper or it's less than two years, I would be the one telling the client, you probably don't want to do it because of depreciation recapture. 
And what does this all mean? It means this. If I save you a dollar in taxes this year, what are you going to do with that dollar? Because you're going to have to pay me. So you're going to have to, you know, pay me. And then you're going to have to, you know, have that dollar for long enough to make money on that dollar. Now, I, my clients are very successful. My clients are, are buildings, you know, all over the United States and they're big buildings. And bottom line is if I give them a dollar, their IRR is like 60 percent, 70 percent. So so a two year hold is not a problem. So if they can't have that dollar for two years and their IRR is 60 percent and they have to pay me and then they have to pay depreciation recapture back. They're saying, yeah, we'll do this all day long. A lot of accountants just don't get the time value of money and what that means. The clients, the owners do because they're saying, well, I don't want to write this check out to the IRS for whatever, $5,000, $10,000, $100,000. $100, I want to keep that money and buy more real estate. And that's what we were able to do. So here's how I'll just make this real simple. It's a very complex part of the depreciation. But bottom line is what we share with our clients is that when you do cost segregation, you are um, able now to tell the IRS how much of that five-year property has been used up. It's just like getting a laptop, buying a truck. You're using it up. It's not going to be worth the same amount when you finally sell it. So let's say two years down the road, and you're talking about the five-year property, what we would tell the client and the accountant to do is tell the IRS, you're going to take two, two years or 20% of that depreciation off the table because basically I used it up. It's, it's not as valuable anymore. So what do we, we've just done? We've taken from the basis of the building that's, that's, uh, and the depreciation taken, we've taken that off the table. So actually, cost segregation reduces depreciation recapture if you have a savvy accountant and they know what they're doing. So I haven't had the, the depreciation recapture pushback in so long. I would have to restudy what it's all about because most of our clients, they just know, forget about it. It's not, not an important card, you know, in the whole equation. Yeah. Are there any other special circumstances that would either push you towards doing cost segregation, even if you were holding it for less than two years, or on the flip side, maybe a situation where you might not recommend a cost segregation? Well, the, the not re recommending, again, I, I just think it's not worth going through all of that because, you know, you're going to have to identify all of the, you're going to have to help me. So a lot of buildings don't have construction plans and we're construction engineers that those are gold. And we realize you're not going to have construction plans. If a building was built in the 19, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 getting plans, forget about it. So bottom line is um, it's not worth the pain to try and, you know, help us out and get, you know, appraisals and all this. So if, if it's two years or less, again, I think that without, without even looking at the math now where it would be advantageous is I've had this happen where, I've had a, a, a flipper who owed a lot of money, $200,000 in taxes. And he goes, you know what? I am going to still do cost segregation because I know if I can, use, I can take that $200,000, I can make a lot of money on that $200,000. So it's worth it for me. I don't care if I have to pay it back, depreciation recapture. I'm going to still do it because I'm bailing myself out from writing that check for $200,000. So I think it just depends on, on the uh, investor's um, ability, what, what can they do with that money? You know, that's the, the biggest thing. The other um, issue that would come about is, uh, and this is one of the strongest, the, 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 the concept of, of passive investors versus active. So basically, I know, again, this gets complex, but I'll make it a very high level. Basically, the, the, the passive investor is one who has another source of income. That's a passive investor. So let's say it's a doctor. The doctor buys a building. He's a passive investor because he's getting a check from his medical um, um, business, and uh, that's his active income. So there are rules against using passive losses. What happened in the 1980s is that, again, I'll pick on doctors, is the doctors were buying slum-ridden houses that were not even you know, inhabitable. And they were using the depreciation to wipe out their, their taxes on their doctor's income. <laughs> and Congress and the IRS said, no, 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 no. You can't do that. So they came up with the passive act rules. So what I would do to make this very crystal clear is simply ask your accountant. I would get an estimate from me. We don't charge est for estimates. And I'd go back to the accountant and I'd say, Mr. Accountant, Joe's going to give me $25,000 in, um, in passive losses. 
Can I use them? Let them tell you. If the answer is no, don't move forward. Don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And generally, uh, you can use passive losses to offset passive gains. And then if you're active in the investment, so on the, the general partnership side of a, a real estate syndication in our little ecosystem, then you get to use that to offset other income um, or all active income, assuming you meet the real estate professional guidelines. But, but the important thing is what you just nailed down is that, Pat, a lot of accountants don't know this. What I create in passive losses can be used against any passive income. It doesn't have to be that one apartment complex you know, in, in Boulder, Colorado. It can be used for any passive investment as a group. You can group all your passive losses and all your passive income together. That's important to realize. So there are many, many circumstances where even though I'm giving passive losses, they can use them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, we keep coming back to this. Neither of us are accountants. Um, so this is a uh, just general pontification. This is not sound tax advice, but having a good CPA on your team, whether you're a, a limited partner, a passive investor, or an active investor, it's really important. Uh, we've discovered that at LifeBridge Capital, you know, with uh, different firms that we've worked with, there's different ways to look at guidelines. And then there's just, you know, different levels of uh, acumen and, uh, and up to speed on what's going on in real estate tax law. How do you recommend finding a good accountant? I think, um, call Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 you, you, you probably need to stay in your world of, of real estate and ask, your, um, and ask your other contacts. Ask the Joes, U.S. Tax Advisors Group. Ask, you know, Sam's. Ask everybody out there um, who's involved in real estate and say, this is my situation. I want to find somebody who specializes in real estate and who, who is a good accountant. The location of the accountant uh, office is not important. So as long as you find somebody good, as long as you find somebody that you feel is charging you fair you know, value, then um, just ask your, your network of, of groups. And I think most people in real estate, they have a network of advisors. They should, and they should be able to pick, pick one, but make sure they're, they're involved in real estate. I've seen this so many times where you get the uh, accountant who basically deals with, with people who work for corporations. They're not investors. And it's like, they don't know, they can't even spell depreciation. So. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a, a, an underrated yet hugely valuable part of your team. Even if you're a passive investor is making sure that you've got an accountant that recognizes what to do with potential passive losses um, and help you strategize around reducing your taxable income. Yes. So. Well said. Um, generally, uh, Joe, we've had uh, all of our projects. We've done cost segregation studies. You know, at LifeBridge Capital, we're doing larger projects. You know, fifteen million dollars and up. Um, you know, large apartment complexes. Um, and I've always heard that you know, if it's under five hundred thousand dollars or it's a single family home, you generally don't want to fiddle with a cost segregation study because it's going to cost more than it's worth. But then you just alluded to maybe some flippers. Uh, doing cash segregation, just they recognize time value of money and deferring it even by a year is huge for them. Uh, is that general rule of thumb true or am I misinformed that uh, single family homes usually aren't worth doing cost seg? That's a double-edged sword, but, but the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so here's the deal. I st when I started, like everybody, back in 2008, we were all, if you go to the audit technique guidelines, and that's our Bible, so we play by the IRS rules, and that's what we do. And so bottom line is um, the audit technique guidelines. If you go to whatever it is, chapter one, it'll list, I think, seven different uh, methodologies that they recognize. The top one, and that's the one that we always use, it's called the detailed engineering approach. And that means you have a construction engineer who basically goes through the plans, the drawings, and we go out and we, we have to look at the building, we have to measure everything, we have to document it, we have to take pictures. And bottom line, that takes a lot of engineering um, hours and a lot of money. So you're right. I mean, in the old days, you couldn't touch a, a building with a basis of under $500,000. And again, I think your, your, your uh, audience is savvy enough, but when I say building basis, land is not depreciable. So you, you've got to carve out land U.S. tax advisors, we're not land appraisers, so we leave that to the client and the accountant to come up with whatever allocation they want to give, give to, um, to land. 
So now I've got the building basis um, to work with. So if the building basis is under $500,000 and the building is in, in Denver, well, I'm not going to send somebody to fly to Denver. It, it, it wouldn't make financial sense. So bottom line is about five years ago, we came up with another technique, which is listed as one of the acceptable techniques. It's called the modeling technique. We used an engineered based um, uh, statistical analysis and we can use our satellite software to do the um, to do uh, the look of the property. We get the information from the client, very simple, like an appraisal. And basically we can do everything in um, our offices and these studies cost hundreds of dollars. So bottom line is now we're talking about how small of a building. I've seriously done uh, single family homes in Alabama years ago with that, that had ba a basis for $20,000, $25,000. So today those don't exist anymore. But bottom line is uh, any single family home that you buy in the United States, we can now probably give you uh, the numbers are going to work. We're going to be able to accelerate your depreciation. Um, but you still have to look at the same thing. You have to look at what are you going to do with the depreciation? How much is the cost for the study? Uh, the one thing that you get when you use U.S. Tax Advisors Group is you get us to defend you uh, if there's an audit or questions. Now, you're going to ask me, Joe, how often do we get audited? Well, I'll tell you what. We uh, play by the rules and we don't get audited. We've had clients get audited, but they got audited for other reasons. And then the auditor, then the agent would say, well, wait a minute, you did cost segregation. Let's look at that. And then they'd come back and ask a question. Well, how did you calculate the square footage of the countertops and all that? And then we tell them, here's my engineer. He'll explain. So the engineer does all of them. And then that's it. They say, okay, thanks. Bye. So we have not been, uh, we're not party to any audits, but if we, if you were audited, we would go to bat for you and we'd answer our work. We would explain how we came up with our findings. And they're all, like I said, again, uh, you know, we, we play by the rule book. So everything is, is, is uh, pretty much after the end of, of the conversation, it's over and done with. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I appreciate you going into some detail on that. Um, a question that comes to mind. So you talked about the detailed engineering approach, which is, I think, what most multifamily syndicators are familiar with. You go through that whole engineering process. And then this modeling technique. Uh, which is a lot more scalable or you can scale down to a lot smaller properties. Right. Um, why not use the modeling technique for larger properties? Is it because you have to be more conservative in your estimates and you're not extracting as much value or as could be extracted if you did the detailed approach? Here's what happened. The, 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 the talent that wrote our program, they came up, this was their conclusion. They, and by the way, we, we will, I mean, we may go over a little bit like the 510,000, but we don't go over it very much farther than 500,000. And what we decided was that we felt we could not defend our work with the IRS if it, the numbers and the analysis and the algorithms get sloppier and sloppier as the building basis increases. And we just decided it's not worth our time to try to defend work that we thought would be to the point of maybe not even be able to defend. We feel very comfortable in 500,000 or less, no problem. But over 500,000, we won't do it. We'll, we have to do the full detailed approach. Yeah. But yeah. now here's one thing I wanna to explain to everybody. The modeling approach is not meant to replace everything that the full detailed approach does. So for example, one of the values of doing cost segregation if you're doing a value add property, you buy a multifamily, you're going in and each, I know exactly what you're going to do. You're going to rip out the counters. You're going to rip out the flooring. You're going to, you're going to paint it. You're going to, you know, blah, 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 blah. I've been involved in many of those. And what we do is when you have the detailed approach, you have how many linear feet of the counters. And, and, and when we did the, um, the analysis, what the value is, because when you go in there and you rip that stuff out and you throw it away, that all has write-off value. Modeling will not give you that. We're not, we're not giving you linear feet of countertops. We, we have no idea. Too much time and work. We're just telling you, you can use the modeling to accelerate the depreciation. That's what we're giving you. But the detailed engineering approach for someone that has a building over 500,000, even though it's going to cost more, might be well worth it. I've had many times where the, where the dispositions, the stuff they threw away, was is like 10 times more than what they paid for the whole study just on that part alone. Yep. 
So. We've, we've definitely seen the value of having those detailed figures so we can go back in our value add projects and write off everything that we're pulling out and send into the landfill or send into Habitat for Humanity or wherever they end up. So. Well, it will be the, you know, be the leader on that because a lot of accountants still don't get it. They don't understand that all of that stuff that's thrown away has value. That's all able to write off. Yeah. So, okay. One of the things is we're getting close to the end here, Joe, that I wanted to touch on as I was browsing through your website was the 45L tax credit. Um, and I don't want us to get stuck in, in the morass and all the details that are there, but if you could at a high level, just give our audience uh, a brief overview of what 45L encompasses. Okay, 45L and, and 179D are energy studies and where they draw the line is uh, anything under four stories or less is a 45L project. Anything above four stories is a 179D. And what you're getting is you're getting energy tax credits. And what the IRS, the government, whatever you want to say, they're, what they're doing is they're telling the, uh, the owner that if you make um, uh, improvements to the building and you improve the energy envelope in three areas, you're going to qualify for a 2000 per door tax credit. Tax credits are valuable. They're not like extra depreciation. A tax credit is, is the $2,000 tax credit. If you've got a even a 10 unit uh, building, you're going to get $20,000 just wiped off your taxes. That's how powerful a tax credit is. Whereas when I talk about depreciation, depreciation is an expense. So if, if somebody wants to know on that expense, how much money you're going to save out of your pocket, take the losses I estimate and, and, and deduct that for, and, and use your tax rate. So if you're on the 40% tax rate and I save you, I give you $100,000, you're going to save $40,000. A $2,000 tax credit is, means you are actually going to save $2,000 in taxes. So very powerful. And what the three areas that we're looking at is we're looking at the HVAC system. Pretty simple. That means the air conditioner, the heating. And guess what? Any that you buy today is going to be energy compliant because in most states around the country, you can't even buy an HVAC unit that's not compliant. Number two is the... Um, is the electrical appliances, the light bulbs, the light fixtures. Are they, in, are they, when you bought the new ones, are they energy compliant? And the third one is the energy envelope, the doors, the seals, the windows. Are they, will they reduce the energy consumption? And, and the only problem about doing this is that we're very competitive with rates. We're very good. However, we do have to send an engineer to, to, to the location. So that's the issue. It's not the cost of the study. It's the cost of the study after I send somebody to Alabama. So therefore, it, 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 there's only two ways to do this. Either you have a large portfolio, meaning you've got 20 uh, single family homes that you fixed up, or you can combine with friends because if I have to, oh, and guess what? My engineer has to drive because there's testing material that we can't figure a way out to fly it out there. So he's got to get, he's got to, he's got to drive out to Alabama. And so that all takes time and money. So that's the only problem with the 45 L. But even if you can find somebody in, in Alabama to do it, it, it's big. So look into it. If somebody wants me to help them out, I help anybody out by email, by phone, call me and I'll put you in touch with my engineer and I can give you more information. But, um, most value adds, you, you are taking care of, you are increasing the energy envelope. Hmm. Very interesting. So it doesn't apply just to new development. You can also take advantage of that tax credit on a yes. value add. Right. Okay. And can you combine the 45L? Like, is it the same engineer on your side that does the 45L and the cost segregation? No, that's a different, you know, I hate to say it's a different animal. You know, the one side's construction engineers, the other guy's an energy engineer, and the in energy engineer has his hat on, and all he's doing is the testing for the energy savings. And there is testing that has to be done. Yep. So. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you shedding light on cost segregation, some of the finer points there, Joe, as well as the 45L tax credit. Um, definitely look forward to learning more about that. Um, in the meantime, where can our audience find out more about you, your company, and how can they get in touch with you? I think the website's the best. It's U.S. Tax Advisors Group, which is U.S.T.A.G.I.N.C. 
So uh, my email is Joe V. My last name is Byrie. So J-O-E-V at U-S-T-A-G-I-N-C dot com. If you go to our website um, and fill out the um, input page, we will give you a no cost estimate on how much tax savings uh, we will be able to provide. And so I advise everybody just go online, go to our, our input form, give us the, the answers to a few questions and we'll respond back with a free um, estimate. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Joe. Really appreciate it. Thank you to our audience for joining us on another episode of the Real Estate Syndication Show. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.